السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يبقى قولي uh, First I want to say thank you so much for staying for, for my talk Everybody's already eaten and heard everything and donated and here you still are So I'm, I'm very privileged and grateful to you And I'm also really honored to share the stage for this critical organization that we're all here to celebrate, we're all here to support. I am so proud, I am so heart, it is so heartwarming and so affirming to me as a Muslim to hear about the work of ICNA's social, social justice initiative. What it says to me is that Muslims are building institutions that don't just tell people who we are, but show them. That live out the prophetic legacy of standing with the vulnerable and fighting for justice wherever we are. You know, a little about me, I, I was born in Egypt and I moved to the United States when I was five years old with my family and we, I grew up in a town called Madison, Wisconsin. Has, every, has anyone ever heard of Madison? Anyone? Okay. So for anyone who's, who hasn't heard of Madison, Madison is a, is a college town, right? That's why we, we moved there. My parents were pursuing their PhDs and it's, um, it's a very progressive town. Uh, that's the language we would use today. So it's very, very uh, left-leaning, sort of liberal. Sometimes it's called the People's Republic of Madison, things like that. So this is the town I grew up in. And why I describe it this way is because, you know, being one of very few Muslims in this town attending public school, um, I was surrounded by the language of social justice. It was just what was taken for granted. It's just how people thought about things. So Madison was uh, one of the places that was at the forefront of the anti-war movement, for example, in the 60s. And, and, even in, uh, and even more recently, in 2003, against the Iraq War. So this idea of social justice was was everywhere around me. And at the same time, I, um, I was raised in a traditional Egyptian Muslim household. And what that means is that Islam was taught to us as a vessel in which we um, put our values. So Islam was, was a framework rather than a spiritual reality. Let me put it that way. And, and it was how our parents raised us. They, they, gave us um, they gave us boundaries, ethical boundaries to live a healthy life. But the way you know, a teenager experiences that is that there were a lot of restrictions on us, me and my sisters. And so it was this, this, this process that I was going through as a young person of reconciling this social justice milieu that I was surrounded by, that I believed in, and this, this traditional upbringing. And as I tried to figure this out, I, I was, a, you know, I was a student, a good student, alhamdulillah, I did a lot of reading, and I, I stumbled on a book in my, in my high school library. I went to a public school, as I mentioned, 2,000 kids in this high school. Very, very academically rigorous high school, had tons of books in the library. So I, I found this book uh, just completely by chance, and it was about the civil, uh, a civil rights leader. And to my surprise, because this was a long time ago before social media or anything where people knew anything, to my surprise, this civil rights leader shared my religion. And that was like mind blowing for me as a 15 year old. Because I had no idea 
that Muslims shaped what I believe to be the most important movement in American history. That Muslims helped to lead in the civil rights movement. And of course, this was the autobiography of Malcolm X. And reading that book, I really put it as a, a pivotal, transformational event in my life. Because it helped me understand a few things. First, that my Muslim identity and my American identity were not separate things. That understanding the legacy of Muslim struggle and of the black liberation movement in our country helped me become an American Muslim. It was my path to finding out who I was. By understanding the tradition of social justice in this country and the role Islam played and the role Muslims played in it. It also taught me something at a very young age as a non-black Muslim that I owed a whole lot of debt to my black Muslim brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah. For my ability to call on the civil rights movement to claim my rights. For the psychological space and the cultural norm of being able to be unapologetically Muslim. That is a legacy that I am inheriting. And I am indebted to that. To that movement, to our brothers and sisters who have established this norm through enormous sacrifice and struggle. Now, today, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you about our community. This might seem strange that I I want, to, I want to share with you a profile of what we as an American Muslim community look like. Because so many of us actually don't know ourselves. We need to educate ourselves on who we are here in this country. And only by understanding who we are and what we contribute can we fully live out our call to establish justice on earth. Today, Muslims are the most ethnically, racially diverse community in America. As a faith community, we are unique. We stand out in one unique way, in that we are the only faith community where no one race is a majority. So you choose any other faith community and they have a majority race. It's actually, with, with, with almost no exception, with, uh, if it's a, you know, a large um, religious community. Every major religious community in America, the majority of, of those adherents are white. Muslims are the only exception to that. We have no majority. And that is incredibly powerful. Because we, we simply have no other choice but to celebrate and leverage our diversity. There is no other choice. So a third of our community are African American. Another 25% are between, are either, uh, Arab, South Asian, or they identify as white. Seven percent of us are Latino. And then the rest is every other group mixed and just don't want to identify. Now, before anyone, this is always the question, so I'm just going to answer it before it comes up. Twenty-five percent are white? Are you kidding me? 
That is actually the truth. Uh, and it's been, uh, with every study, not just the ones that ISPU, the organization I work for does, but Pew and Gallup, every study finds the same exact number. These are folks that identify as white. So you can be Turkish, you can be Persian, you can be Russian, you can be Chechen, you can be Bosnian. All of these folks identify as white. And then there are, of course, some Arabs who do as well. So yes, 25% identify as white. And then there are also just European, uh, you know, people of European descent who are Muslim, of course. Muslims are also a powerful economic engine in this country. Did you know that in New York City alone, right, the city of where our, our fearless leader is from, in New York City alone, Muslims create 250,000 jobs. That's more jobs than Chrysler and Ford create in Michigan. In all of Michigan, and we bailed those companies out because it was so vital to the American economy that they stay afloat. And yet in the very city of the person who wants to ban Muslims, Muslims create more jobs than these companies that we spent billions of dollars saving. So when I say that Muslims are a nest, are, are a, not, they're not only, I mean, here's, here's the question. You know, I'll, I'll give you just an interesting little factoid that you can share with your friends before I go on, on uh, when it comes to economic, um, economic powerhouse. When does Islamophobia spike in the public? Yes. That's absolutely right. Islamophobic views associating Islam and violence in the public do not go up after an actual act of violence carried out by a Muslim. They go up around election seasons and in the drum up to war. So the association of Islam and violence is a manufactured political tool to manipulate the public to act in a certain way. Islamophobia is a threat to democracy. And so if you remember in the 2016 elections, there was this debate where one side, I won't you know, name any names, one side was arguing that Muslims were a threat, that they needed to be banned, that they needed to be surveilled. Some people were even suggesting that mosques be shut down. And on the other side, what was the argument? No, no, Muslims are good and harmless and actually help in uh, you know, stopping terrorism by reporting on their uncle. So those are the choices we were basically presented with. Why are they bad answers? Why are both of them bad choices? Because it was the wrong, it was an answer to the wrong question. It was the wrong mental model, it was the wrong framework that we were getting an answer to. So as a researcher, I ask questions for a living. And I know that there is such thing as a biased question where any answer is wrong because you've asked the wrong question. What is the question that is being answered when the two, the two options are we need to, you know, ban them or we need to engage them because they're helping with terrorism. The question is this. The Muslim community is a lump that we've discovered in the body of America. And as the many doctors in the room will tell you, what is the question you're asking when you discover a tumor? 
You ask, is it benign or is it cancerous, right? If it's, if it's malignant and cancerous, you, you take it out, you ban it, you, you remove it. But if it's benign, they're, 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 they're okay, they're not, gonna, they're not harmful. If it's benign, you still keep it under surveillance. You still keep it on, you still go back to the doctor every once in a while to make sure it's still benign. But is that tumor of any help to the body? No. Does it even really belong in the body? No. So it's the wrong answers. Both of them are wrong because it was the wrong question and it's the wrong model. Muslims are not a benign tumor in the body of America. Muslims are a vital organ in the body of America. America would be less prosperous, less innovative, less fair, and less safe if Muslims didn't call it home. That's just the reality of the numbers. That's not, that's not a feel-good statement. In Michigan alone, and Michigan, contrary to popular belief, is not a majority Muslim state, okay? Let me just clear that up. The percentage of Muslims in Michigan is less than 3%. Not, it's not majority Muslim, as you might uh, have been led to believe. Less than 3% of Michigan is Muslim. But 15% of the doctors are Muslim in Michigan. Muslims contribute $5.5 billion to the economy in Michigan. They are four times as likely to give to charity as the general public. But the other side of the spectrum is also important to understand. Muslims are an economic engine to America. But did you know that in our faith community, we have the largest percentage of people living under the poverty line? Did you know that? Nearly a third of us is either at or below the poverty line. So we have a lot of work to do, brothers and sisters. So what should we do to leverage our diversity rather than let people or ourselves make it a point of weakness? or a point of fracture. The first thing is what the Qur'an tells us, that we were created in nations and tribes so that we may know each other. This is essential advice. Do we know each other? Do we know each other's histories? Have we entered each other's spaces across cultural lines? Do we know what our priorities are? What are we really struggling with? Knowing each other's histories, knowing each other's struggles, each other's narratives is the beginning of building a strong foundation for unity. The second thing that we have to do is we have to create common cause. What I love so much about this initiative and this institution, ICNA's Council for Social Justice, is about giving us a common cause that we can all sign up to because it is core to our faith. Social justice. You know, I, I remember as, as a young person growing up in my mosque in Madison, we would have these things called unity dinners. Has anyone been to a unity dinner? Yeah? Well, I don't know about you, but here was what my unity dinner looked like. It was people sitting at different tables with their friends, speaking their language to each other, and that was it. We ate some food and we left. 
Being in the same room is a good first step. But unity doesn't happen over biryani. It really doesn't. I love, I would eat biryani for breakfast, lunch, and dinner if I could. But it doesn't create unity. Unity requires that people sweat together. Believe in the same thing. Walk together the same mile. So working for social justice has so many other benefits than just the, the, the direct impact of that work. It means that we come together for something toward the pleasure of Allah. And that's where unity comes from. And the third thing, and I think this is actually the most important, is we have to do the spiritual work of checking ourselves. There is no substitute for that. How are we checking our own bias and unintended prejudice? And this isn't to call anyone any names. Everyone suffers from this. This is a human condition. We just have to become aware of it and educate ourselves away from it. You know, I recently read a great book I actually recommend to every single person in this room. It's called How to Be an Anti-Racist by a man named Dr. Ibram Kendi. He's not Muslim. I, I thought he was from his name, but, but he's not. So he, this book called How to Be an Anti-Racist, there are a few things that really struck me from this book. One is that he says, and really goes on to prove very convincingly, that you can't just be not racist. That just passively, not, passively being not racist is not enough, and it actually doesn't work, because the momentum of society is toward a racist structural system. That if you're just passive, you, you're actually complicit in the maintenance of the status quo. He said you actually have to be anti-racist. And then he gave some examples. And what blew me away is if you look at the seerah and at the Qur'an, the Qur'an is not not racist. The seerah and the Prophet والسلام, is not not racist. He was an anti-racist because he did things deliberately to break a status quo. Yeah. <laughs> Through small gestures and large gestures. Did you know, for example, we, we all learn in Sira class that Osama bin Zayed, he was 17 years old and put as the head of the, the military. We know that. And we always hear that he's 17 and like, wow, mind blown, he's commanding the, the nobility of Quraysh. Did you also know he happened to be black? Do you, do you understand the significance of what the Prophet ﷺ was doing? He was not just passively not racist. He was doing things to be anti-racist. The Qur'an is exactly in the same vein. Calling out our diversity as a ayah of Allah, as something that isn't just accidental, but is something deliberate and beautiful. So we all have to think about how we are living this, this value in our lives. That is the third and I think the most important aspect of how to leverage our assets of diversity of contribution. It has to be that inner work, brothers and sisters. So I'll, I'll end with this. I recently heard an interview, and uh, uh, Oprah, who I, this is my guilty pleasure, I listen to like all her podcasts, you know, 
Super Soul Sunday, that's, that's me in the car every day. So she was interviewing Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, if you aren't familiar with her, some, I'm sure many of you know who she is, but if you're not familiar, she wrote uh, the book Eat, Pray, Love, and many other books. Um, she's a best-selling author, and of course a movie was made about the book starring Julia Roberts, so she's this really very influential person in her sphere. And Oprah asked her this question. She said, when have you experienced grace? When, no, she actually said, when is the greatest time you've experienced grace and you knew it? And I was expecting something, you know, I mean, she has a lot of quirky ideas, but you know, I, I was expecting, oh, when I was, you know, meditating in India, I experienced some kind of enlightenment or something. But you know, she didn't say anything like that. She said, I was in Indonesia on this tiny little island by myself. I had gone through a horrible divorce. I was depressed. And I would walk around the island every day, just something I was, you know, something to do. And I would see this Muslim woman every time I walked around this island. And we didn't share a language, so she would just sort of you know, bow her head and touch her heart, and I would do the same, and, and that was it. And we, we would see each other every day. The island was very tiny. And then, um, in my little hut, I got incredibly sick. I got so sick, I, I literally thought I was going to die of food poisoning. And I had no food, I had no water, and I physically was too weak to move or call for help. And I thought, this was it. I'm going to die here in this hut. And then this woman, she said this Muslim woman, and she was very pointed about the fact this was a Muslim woman, came to me, and she found me. She, she said I, she must have not seen that I was walking that day. She knew something was wrong. She came to my hut. She knocked on the door, and she came in, and she saw that I was sick. She left, she came back with food and water, and I was so moved, and I just cried in her arms as she held me, without words. And she said, and I knew the grace of God in that, in that experience. Allah. <laughs> and then you know what she said? She goes, and, for, and from then on, this was the face of Islam for me. No matter what happens, this is the face of Islam for me. <laughs> SubhanAllah. That act of kindness may have done more than so, so many large gestures. So yes. Never underestimate the smallest act of kindness. This is how we make change in the world. Thank you.